That's actually a little dance I'm doing right now on purpose because this series... I, I, I have no idea what kind of dances you go to, but I do not dance to that music right there. Uh, what was that? Is that polka or something? What was it? Was it polka? Yeah, I'm, I'm, from, I'm from Indiana. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's different. different. I, I grew up, you know, where we listen to different kind of music that you can't play in church. So uh, anyway... I'm kind of excited, man, because this is it. We're done. Like, that series, done. You can clap if you want to. Like, that's how I'm feeling. I'm like, ah, because we've been talking about feelings and, like, uh, below the surface stuff for the last 16 weeks. I know. You know what's worse is, like, when you preach it, you got to live it. Um, And there's been a lot of uh, personal conviction that I've had. Which has been good. I mean, this series has kind of messed me up in a good way, um, especially lately. The last two weeks, as we've talked about the whole fixed hour of prayer, and uh, some of you are like, "What? Like that's a Catholic thing?" Nope. It's a it's a rhythm thing, right? It's uh, stopping every in the morning, kind of the afternoon, uh, mid afternoon, in the evening to take about fifteen minutes to kind of recenter yourself with God. It's a rhythm. And I don't know about you, but I have found myself living life at a ridiculous type of uh, rhythm. Actually, no rhythm. Just, just running full speed, full tilt with no stopping. And, and, and God's been using that to really kind of uh, speak to me. And then last week we talked about the Sabbath and uh, told you I was going to turn my phone off. Um, and I did. Wow. Uh, yeah, some withdrawals for real. Like I... A few times I like reached and I was like, what, what am I reaching for? It's not even there. Um, but just, just trying to take 24 hours to stop and to slow down. And, you know, with starting that treatment center that we've been working on, um, it's kind of been like working two full-time jobs with the church and with that. And so, you know, I've just been kind of going at an unrealistic pace. And kind of what we've talked about a little bit was you wouldn't listen to music with no rhythm because it's kind of uh, horrible. Uh, I wonder if people feel the same way when they get around us and we're living life with no rhythm, if it's kind of horrible to be around me. Um, and so anyway, so hopefully that, you know, but, but that's the kind of stuff that we've been talking about. And, you know, you're like, wow, that's great, except, yeah, until you preach it and then you're convicted because you're like, well, I'm a hypocrite because I'm not really living that. So, um, but I want to I wanna tie all of this up, bring everything to a close. So the whole mindset of this building below the waterline is many of us seen the leadership thing with the iceberg and you only see about 10% of what's above the water and 90% of who you are is below the water and it's that 90% that we mostly never deal with. Um, and so my thought is this though, it's great to see what's below the water, but what are you going to do about it? It's great to be observant of like, oh yeah, there's some pretty gnarly stuff down there, but how do we build from there? How do we start to to transform some of those things? And so my hope is that today's message will kind of bring everything full circle and tie it up and we can be done. That's time for a dance. All right. So anyway... um, Just to kind of recap, if you've never heard this series before, the main idea is we're made up of three parts, right? Our body, and when it comes to our body's maturity, that happens kind of naturally. There's not really a way to stop it. There's no way to stop getting old. You can try to make it look like you're not old, but you're going to get older. This year, I'll be 43. I'm like, wow, that's, I know, you're like, oh, you're just a young pup. Yeah, well, maybe, okay. Uh, and then there's the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions, and that's not so natural, right? And there, how, many, how many know somebody that is older and their soul seems much younger, right? It's probably the 30-year-old still living in your basement, parents, um, <laughs> playing their video games. There's something not right there that needs to be, and you're like, hey, I live with my parents and, and I'm in their basement playing video games. Exactly, the message is for you, listen. Uh, <laughs> And then there's the spiritual part of you, and that's a whole nother level because I know people that have known Jesus or claim to follow Him for a really long time that spiritually are pretty immature. 
And listen, I don't equate their maturity to what they know and don't know because people who've been in church a long time, they know a lot of stuff. They just treat people like they don't know Jesus. Right? You can know the Word. You can know the stories. You can recite everything. It's why some people, I believe we've lost some people in this series, like they've left our church because they don't like this stuff. They want to go to a church that somebody's just going to talk about Jesus every week and that's going to be enough for them. And the reason why is because it's easy to listen to that message and not change. But I understand and follow a Jesus that says, here's who I am, here's who you are, and this is what I'm calling you up to. And if you say you belong to me, then there's a part of you that should reflect me. And you should live your life in such a way that when people see you, they see me. And if you're not living your life that way, then you maybe don't know me the way you think you do. And too often we think, well, but I've been in church for so many years. And? Good. But it's, what are you doing with it? And so that's kind of what, what this message has been all about. Um, and so this idea that we've had is, I can't be mature spiritually if I'm not willing to work on the emotional parts of me as well. And it's not a quick fix. In fact, something we've said throughout this whole thing is anything in life we do that has any real value is a journey and not a destination. It's a journey. Anything in life that we're trying to do to, to do something, become something, overcome something, that's going to be a journey. There's not going to be a quick fix. And I think sometimes that's where it gets difficult is we're expecting it to be instant and it's not. Now, here's a really cool part of it being a journey, is it means that I have opportunity to figure this out, right? That there isn't this idea that I need to be somewhere by tomorrow, that I don't have to feel like a failure just because I mess up, just because I miss the mark, just because I fall short doesn't mean I'm done, because it's a journey. Just like uh, Divinity and Dominic, when they start learning to walk, how many understand like from day one, they're not cruising down the hallway? There's going to be moments where they're going to fall. There's going to be moments where they're going to drop. And if their parents were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you fell. Well, I guess no good for you. You're done. I mean, good, good luck. <laughs> but yet sometimes we think that's how God responds to us and let's just be honest, the reason we think that is often that's how we as other believers respond to people in our lives who should know better, should do different. It's a journey. It's not, it's not a destination. I love how the Bible puts it in the message in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Is my PowerPoint broken? Oh, there it is. It says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me and get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. That sounds somewhat contradicting to the faith that I have grew up in. The faith that I was taught felt real heavy. That like Jesus was always kind of watching me because I was probably going to mess up, which I did not disappoint him. Um, and that I was always trying to get it right and do it right and be enough and be good enough and try to hit the mark that people were setting before me. And what I'm hearing, and some of you are like, well, that's the message. That's some watered down version. But the more you start to understand Jesus, the more you understand that you're his kid and he's wanting to remove the burdens from you so you can live a life that is full and joyful. You think any one of these parents are thinking to themselves, I wonder what kind of burdens I can put on my kids just to make life that more difficult. No. He's trying to remove the burdens from your life. He's trying to strip away the things that make the, the journey difficult because he wants us to enjoy that. So this morning, I want to look at a passage of Scripture, and I'm probably going to mess with some of you today because... It's been messing with me a little bit, but I think it kind of ties up everything that we've been talking about throughout this whole series. Why is God so concerned with these things in my life like anger and emotion and, and, and just false perceptions of how I see myself and I see the world and I see Jesus? Why does that matter so much to Him? Because He's trying to, to produce something inside of me of good. 
And, and too often, the, those things get messed up. I, here, here's what I think is, is, is let's just kind of talk about what we understand. Let me, let me speak from my own perspective so I don't offend everybody, right? Um, what I understood about faith was this. When I was a kid or a youth group, I would be in service and I would hear a preacher preach and he would say these things. And usually at the end, now I went to a church where hell was a, a two-syllable word. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, you better get yourself right right now or you're going to go to hell. That was fun for me, man. I like that kind of preaching, so I, I miss it. Um, but anyway, it was like a two-syllable word. And everything was sending you straight to hell, no lie. Um, in fact, I can remember growing up, we used to do... So mom had a rule. You always had to go to church no matter what, right? I had a friend who was like, he was Baptist, okay? And if you're Baptist, no offense, but his Baptist church was the kind that they did not, all, the, the pastor, all he did is get up and read from the King James Version, okay? And when they sang, they did not clap. There was no music. It was the perfect church to go to after a Saturday night <sighs> hangover on Sunday morning, okay? Um, now, my church was this kind of church where it's like loud and the drums go in. And man, if you had a hard Saturday night, this is the worst place you want to be on a Sunday morning. I'm just going to tell you, every time that bass hits, you're like, oh, if you want to be good to me, Jesus, that'll stop right now. So anyway, that was just my world. That's where I came from. And so um, I would, you know, I would definitely avoid my church on a Sunday morning because everything I did was for sure sending me straight to hell. And that's kind of what I understood about God was he was kind of always mad at me. He was like perma ticked off, right? Always like, Chris, I thought better of you. I, I didn't realize I projected my parents onto Jesus. And that's not, he's not the same. Thank God. Um, so anyway, this morning, I want to kind of unpack this and teach you some things. But, but what I think happens is in my mindset and where I was at, this is what I understood was my job was to come to the altar and ask Jesus to save me because I didn't want to go to hell. And then once I got that straight, then this is what I needed to do. I had to work really, really hard at trying to be a good Christian boy who did the right things and, and went to church and didn't smoke, and didn't chew, and didn't go out with them other girls that do, and like just really focused in on just trying to be the best person I can, and I didn't listen to this kind of music, and I didn't have those kind of friends, and I didn't see those kind of movies, and it was just all this stuff that felt overwhelming, and the reality is this, I got saved every week. <laughs> Not really, okay? But in my mind, I had to because, like, he would get up there and preach, and I'd be like, that's it, I'm going to hell again. Like, I told I listened to Dr. Dre this week. I couldn't help it. <laughs> Chronic is my weakness. Um, and so, you know, it was just, it was tough, and it was hard. And, and I think, I think some of us are still caught in that mindset where we see God as this, like, parent that you cannot please person that no matter how hard you try you fail have you ever felt like living your life for christ was like running on a treadmill like you go real hard but you get nowhere maybe it's because you have that same mindset and what i want to unpack today through through the word of god is that i don't believe that's accurate turn with me in your bibles today to john chapter 15 verses just go to 15 we'll just start there now, before we jump in, I've got to set this, the, the background, because if I don't, you're going to totally miss it. Jesus is on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's what we're about to read. He's getting ready to go to the place where he's going to pray, and the Bible says that his, his sweat will fall like drops of blood or will become drops of blood because he'll be such anguish. It's the place where he'll beg God to take it from him. The weight of the cross and all that's about to come is going to hit him and he's going to look up to heaven and say, God, if there's any way to get out of this, let me out. And then at the end, he'll say, not my will, but yours be done. It's a pretty big thing happening. And on his way, he's giving his final instructions to his disciples. Keep in mind, the people he's talking to in this passage are his disciples. He's not talking to a crowd. He's not doing an evangelism crusade. He's talking with the guys who've been walking with him for the past two years. He knows soon he's going to be arrested and killed. And so these are those final instructions. And how many know 
Or if you ever had a moment where you were with somebody as they were coming to the final stages of their life, usually the final words that we say have a lot of weight. Because we're trying to think of what are they going to remember us by. So verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 1, it starts out, it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. And he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. I have to stop. Because I think right there, when you read that and you say he cuts off, like some of you, you have had the benefit of listening to preachers who talk about machete Jesus, right? Who's looking for all the people that are not right, who are listening to the music they shouldn't be listening to and doing the things they shouldn't be doing. And he's going to run in with his machete and like, whack out! And just start chopping people off. Has anybody ever heard this passage of Scripture used to tell you that you need to get right with God or you're going to go to hell? Anybody? Okay. So let me push back on that for a minute. Why would he say that to the same people that he said, my sheep know my voice and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. He's talking to the same guys that he said, no one can snatch you from the palm of my hand. He's saying to the same guys that he spent life with, the same Peter that, that he said, you are a rock and on this rock I'll build my church. And then Jesus is talking about dying. And Peter's like, uh-uh, not over my, over my dead body. And he looks at the same guy and he says, you're the devil, get behind me. Why would he say that to them? Why would he talk to them about this fatalist mentality of I'm just going to cut you off. You're going to be done. I believe we have a really bad interpretation of what that word actually means. If you look in the Greek, okay, and understand our Bible was not written in English, it was written in Greek, okay? And then we do our best to interpret what that Greek word means, but we don't always have the greatest interpretations. This is what I believe based on what it says. This entire metaphor is about Jesus in the vineyard. Now in these days, it's common for the people who are listening to what he has to say to completely make sense of what he's saying. But I'm, I'm just wondering, is there anybody in the house today that owns a vineyard? Because that would be awesome. And I would love to come check it out. Probably not, right? So we don't really grasp the concept of what Jesus is talking about because we've, how many have ever, um, <laughs> can you say this in church? How many have been to a vineyard? Okay, how many have had somebody walk you through the vineyard and explain to you the process of what it takes to make the beverage that you might consume when you go to a vineyard? Okay, me too. In fact, I took my youth group on a field trip to a vineyard. Um, greatest youth pastor ever. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> they kicked me out. But it was very, it was extremely informative to walk through and to hear the practicalness of what it requires to grow fruit in a vineyard. And I'll be honest with you, as I walked through there, I started, this, this verse started to come alive and it started to make sense. And I started to think, you know what, I'm not sure these people that taught me about Machete Jesus are right. Because I'm not sure that's who he is. So let me, let me challenge some mindsets this morning. So God is the gardener. He establishes that. Jesus says, I'm the vine. You're the little shoot, the branch. And on me, you'll bear fruit. So I have a picture of it here just to kind of let you see it. Because um, I'm not taking you to a vineyard right now. Because, no. Um, now I believe it's frightening to contemplate that if we don't bear fruit, we're cut off or taken away. Anybody else? Like you don't bear fruit. Do you understand that sometimes when you plant a vineyard, it takes two or three seasons for that branch to begin to bear fruit. It's not instant. We live in an instant mentality. We believe as soon as I come to an altar and bow my, my knee before Jesus and say, come into my heart, instantly we should start seeing fruit. But yet nature shows us that fruit doesn't happen instantly. It takes time and it takes process. 
I'll just give you an example. I was, I was hanging out with a friend this week, right? And, and through our relationship, she's come to know Jesus. And as we're hanging out, she was talking to us and she was saying, she's saying, you know what? I'm, I'm feeling like I need to stop saying the word Christ. And I was like, oh, tell me more about that. And some of you might be like, well, why didn't you tell her about that in the beginning? Because I could tell her that and she would change it because I said so. But I give her the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to enter the equation and he convicts her and she makes a choice because something in her heart doesn't feel right. I would have messed up the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to do a divine work. Do you know what I did? I just pointed out, I believe that's the Holy Spirit. I believe he's speaking to you. And then that opened up some more conversation of how God's starting to use her. And she's like, I just don't understand. Like, I feel like there's this new stuff happening in my life. And I'm like, look at all the stuff that's gotten out the way. And so now, that's always been there, right? Listen to me, parents. The gifts that God has put inside of divinity and Dominic are there right now. They'll never change, okay? What happens, though, is we grow up in life and things start to happen is stuff begins to complicate and confuse and hide who we actually are. And what's happening in her life is stuff is starting to get out of the way and the gifts of God that have always been there are starting to become more and more real and more revealed. And it's an amazing process to watch. See, but too often we have the machete Jesus mindset where we come in with our spiritual machetes and we start to hack off things and be like, you need to knock that off right now. You said you love Jesus and you're still calling out his name like that. Go for it. And then they will change because you've manipulated them into doing so. Or they'll just say, thank you, no thank you. I guess I'll never hit the mark on this. Do you understand? We have a Holy Spirit whose purpose is to create in us who it is He's called us to be. And it takes process to get there. Sometimes when, when, the, when the fruit has been planted, it doesn't grow right away. And so let's go back to our idea of machete Jesus. It's a frightening to contemplate that if we don't bear fruit, we're cut off or taken away. The Greek word cut off actually is aereo. It means to take away as in to take up or lift up. So what does that mean? When we were in the vineyard, you would at times see branches because you see right there, you can even see kind of a rope going right there. Sometimes the branch would begin to fall down and it would fall into the mud. If that branch was on the ground and in the mud, it was no chance of bearing fruit. So the, vine, the vineyard, the vine dresser, the gardener would come in and he would have to wash the dirt off and pull it up and tie it back up to the branch. So you want to think of a machete Jesus as like, ah, no fruit. <laughs> and I see a Jesus who comes in and sees no fruit. And of course you're bearing no fruit because you're down on the ground and you're covered in mud. So I'm going to wash you. I'm going to clean you. I'm going to pick you back up. I'm going to tie you to the source of life because that is not in the ground. It's not in the mud or the dirt. It's up here with me. I'm going to tie you up so you can start to bear fruit again. And you say, well, where do you get that? If you read on, it says this. When it says, uh, every branch in me that bears no fruit, well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So it'll be even more fruitful. Watch this verse in three. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. I'm not talking about you, disciples. You're clean because I've spoken life into you. You have my word. You don't become a mess just because you mess up. That is a, a false mindset of who Jesus is. You don't bear fruit when you continue to live your life in that way. But you see, understand what God is saying is I want to come. Some of you, you are in the dirt and you're in the mud and you're in the mess and I want to come and pick you up. I want to wash that off of you. I want to tie you back up, tie you to me so that you have the opportunity to grow, to become. I don't think I'm going to make it out of this verse. My whole sermon's getting scrapped right now, but it's all right. It says, you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. And then he says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Those of you who are living your treadmill Christianity, that's probably why. He didn't ask you to be good enough. 
He didn't ask you to work really, really hard to be something that you're not. What did He ask you to do? Remain in Me. Stay connected to Me. Even when it gets hard. Even when you mess up. Keep a connection with Me. Because apart from Me, you can't do anything. Apart from Me, there's no real life. There's no substance to your life. You can work real hard and you're going to have all these little teeny, teeny little grapes. Who wants to work real hard for that? Why? Because you're trying to do it and you have a Holy Spirit and a Jesus who says, I want to produce the fruit in you. So what is your job? Remain. Stay connected. Don't jump. Don't run. Stay on the journey because it will be worth it. Because in the end, He will begin to produce the fruit inside of you that He desires you to have. And your fruit will be good fruit. And other people will eat of that fruit and look at you and look at Him and go, man, there's something about this. I think sometimes when we try to produce our own fruit, it's just a bunch of nasty, sour grapes. People eat your fruit and they're like, eh. I want none of that. How do you know if you're connected? Because it's sweet. Because you can only produce what you're connected to. If you're connected to Christ, the fruit of your life is going to be sweet. It's going to be good. It doesn't mean it's all going to be roses and fluffy stuff. Jesus loves me enough to call me on my stuff. But you know why he's doing it? Not because he's trying to beat me down, because he's trying to pick me up. Because he's trying to clean me off. Because he's trying to produce substance in my life. Because he knows. He made me. And he knows a life that has no substance is going to be an unfulfilled life. And I want my life to be fulfilled. And he wants me to live a life that's fulfilled. Again, he says to his disciples, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, and apart from me, you can do nothing. And if you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Now, the last part of that, he speaks to a pruning process. Once again, as we were in the... um, vineyard, the, the, the gardener, vine dresser, he told us, here's what will happen is sometimes we'll walk by and uh, the grape leaf, those are really good if you like Greek food, by the way, I do, um, but the grape leaf, they, they can overtake the whole plant. And this is what will happen if the, if the vine dresser, the gardener doesn't come in and cut those leaves. And then sometimes there'll even be branches that'll come off that are not life-giving. There's nothing on them but leaves. If he doesn't come in and begin to cut those things, what will happen is the substance from the vine will go to everything. And the purpose is that the substance would go to the fruit because the goal is to grow the fruit. So what the, what the gardener knows is what to look for. Because you see, there's some leaves that have no fruit. And he's going to come in, he's going to cut them off. So that way what will happen is eventually the harvest and the grapes will get bigger and bigger and sweeter. Because there's more substance from the vine going to the fruit. Here's what I love. You're not invited to cut it off yourself. Okay? There's some of you, 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 you maybe have come to Christ and you've made a decision to follow him and you're one of those perfectionist kind of people. I live with one. She's amazing, but um, I shouldn't say a but after that. That's going to get me in trouble. <laughs> She's on her way to Spain. I'm good. Uh, anyway, <laughs> until she watches it. Nine days later, she'll forget. Okay. I wonder sometimes if we go in and we start to see some things and we, we become machete Jesus ourselves, right? And we're trying to cut everything off all at once. Anybody ever exhaust yourself trying to follow Christ? What is Jesus saying? Dad's the gardener. He's going to come along and he knows exactly where to cut. He knows. knows. Now, does that not mean I need to partner with the Holy Spirit? No, I have to partner with the Holy Spirit. 
Because what he may do is he may come in and say, Chris, I need you to stop that relationship. Or I need you to stop that thing that's going on in your life right now. Or I need you to start making a rhythm in your life. Because the way you're living your right life right now will not produce the fruit that I want to see inside of you. And then I have to be in concert with the Holy Spirit and allow him to do that. But when I do, it takes the responsibility off of me to know what I need to do or what I don't need to do. It takes it off of you. I don't need you to come into my life and be my Holy Spirit. I have one. He's right there and he wants to help me grow. And I want to trust him that he knows. And my prayer for you is that you will trust him that he knows in your life. And some of you are like, well, I need to stop doing this and stop doing this and stop doing that. I say stop all that mindset right now and start doing this. Ask the Holy Spirit, what in my life needs to be pruned? Because not only does he know, but he knows how to do it in such a way that will not destroy you, but will build you up. Because if literally the gardener would go in and cut every dead branch and just start whacking things away, do you understand it's all going to die? It can't take that level of trauma. And some of you, it's my hope today that you would understand that about Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you're down in the mud and you feel like that branch that is down. Do you understand you have a God that wants to clean you up, pick you up, tie you to himself? He's not looking to cut you apart and throw you away. He, that is so contrary to his nature. That is not who Jesus is. On top of that, maybe you're here and like me, you've got some areas of your life that need some work. Areas of your life that you feel like, man, I just feel like I'm not producing the things I need to produce. I would invite you to reconnect with the gardener, to reconnect with him and let him speak into your life. There's one point I want to leave you with, and then I'm going to go let you get out of here. Like, I, I made it through three pages of these notes. <laughs> you just say thank you, okay? <laughs> um... Where is it? Here's the truth. Living, connected, abiding, remaining in Jesus both requires and produces emotional health. Jeff, come on up. Here's why. Too often in our culture, we have a mindset that I just want to be authentic. Everybody heard that before? Authenticity just says, this is who I am. I'm just going to be real. I'm going to be me. Okay? That's kind of immature. Especially when it comes to your relationship with God. Because who am I to stand before him? Say, well, hey. Psh, I mean, God, the way I'm working right now, that's just how I work. That's how you made me. The devil doesn't take a day off and neither do I. That's really dumb. And yet, too often we come to that way. There's a difference between authenticity and honesty. Honesty says, this is who I am. But then there's a turn to him and say, but gardener, is this who you want me to be? Is this what you desire for my life? Is this who you created me to be? What I've been understanding as I've gone through this journey thing that I went through, and I blame it all on them for the 16 weeks, their fault this emotional class where I talk about my feelings. I hate doing that. But here's what I'm understanding is a lot of the stuff in my life, a lot of the broken places in my life, I just felt like, you know what? I'm not going to worry about that. I'm not going to mess with that stuff. I'm just going to love Jesus and that'll be enough. And this is what I've begun to understand more and more is those, dead, those leaves in my life, those things that I've never dealt with, yeah, I can still love Jesus, but it's pulling substance away from the fruit of my life that's supposed to be there. I'll just give you a case in point. Almost uh, 15 years of marriage and realizing that, man, the way I've treated my wife has not been great. And I've been a pastor. I should know better. Why? Not because I didn't want to love her right. Because all these things in my life would pull the substance away. So when it came to her, there wasn't much left. So what I'm thankful about, what I'm understanding more and more is as I work on these things, it's not necessarily changing all the relationships of the people in my past, but the relationships I have right now are more filling because substance is no longer going to frivolous things. It's going to the space and the place where it needs to be. 
And now I'm able to love her the way I'm supposed to, to love her the way Jesus loved me. Because I understand what that means more and more. That's my hope for you. That's my desire for you. That's why we did this whole 16 weeks of emotions and feelings and all the madness. <sighs> Is that you would have be inspired to let the Holy Spirit come in and begin to do that work. And as He does that work, that there will be substance in your life. And then as you walk out those doors into your mission field, as you get ready to go to your other six days, that your fruit will be so good that people are going to come and be like, man, what is it about you? All I know is I get around you and it's good. And I want that. What better testimony that we are followers of Jesus, that we have fruit that is good. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word this morning. I thank you for the word that you spoke to me and how you have used this in my own life. I thank you for the new revelation of who you are. I, for, I, I, I ask your forgiveness for thinking of you as Machete Jesus. Just too often in my life, I've heard so many stories of how you're just watching. You're like that eternal elf on the shelf. And now I'm starting to see you that that is so far away from who you are. You're this loving father who looks at me like a child looks at their child, or a parent looks at their child with all these dreams and wonders and ideas for me. And you see me at times carrying burdens that are way too heavy to carry. And there's a part of you that longs to come to me and say, son, I want to take that. You see my life full of so many other things and you want to come in and you want to cut. And the cutting hurts. And the cutting is hard. But what I don't realize is what you cut now produces great things later. So help me to trust you. And I'll be honest, Jesus, I can trust you better when I don't see you standing around with some instrument of pain trying to hurt me. But I start to know you as a God who so desperately loves me and wants my life to matter and wants my life to count and wants my life to be of substance. And that's my prayer for every person in this room, that we would live a life of substance. That we would have the kind of life that people look at and go, there is goodness in that. I pray for any person in this room right now that feels down, that feels in the mud, that feels in the dirt, that feels messed up. I'm telling you, His name is Jesus and He'll pick you up and He'll tie you to Himself. And He'll hold you. He'll clean you. We mean why that is, is just this process of salvation. It's as simple as saying, Jesus, I put my faith in You. I trust You. I invite you to come into my life, to be my Lord, to be my Savior. If you're in this room today and you've never made a commitment to follow Jesus, to abide in Jesus, to remain in Jesus, the amazing part of that commitment is it costs you nothing. He did everything. You don't have to make up for anything you've ever done in the past. You can start right now. You can become a part of what he talks about. You will remain in him. You abide in him. You are grafted, the Bible says, into the vine. And now life gets to flow through you. If you're here today and you say, man, pastor, I've never prayed the prayer to accept Christ as my Savior. Every head bowed, eye closed, nobody looking. Just raise your hand and say, pray for me. I want to give my heart to Jesus today. I want to make a public confession of faith. How many people would say, that's me? Thanks, brother. I see your hand. That's a great decision. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus, I thank you. Your word says that if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you died, you rose from the dead, and I invite you to come into my life, that you will save me. I do invite that. Lord, I want that. I desire that. We pray that this morning. We ask you to do that. We confess that you're Lord. And then make no mistake, it doesn't stop there. Now that I'm a part of the vine, it's time to let the, the vineyard, the vine dresser, the gardener to come in and begin to do the work that he wants to do in me. Maybe that's just cleaning me up and tying me up right now. I want to pray for the rest of you. 
God, I pray for any person in this room that has the same mentality I did coming in. You are kind of a hard guy to please. Would you help us to see you as a father who loves? Not somebody who's against us, but who's really for us. I know the words. I've heard them in church my whole life. But what I know in my head and what I believe in my heart sometimes don't match up. And I need you to help me with that. And the only way that changes is for new revelation to take place. So I invite you to come into the lies and the broken places of my life and bring truth. Church, it's my hope and my prayer for you that your life will bear great fruit. But for that to happen, you've got to remain in Christ. You've got to let him do the work that only he can do. I pray that this week, you just invite the Holy Spirit in your time alone with him. You would just say, Holy Spirit, there's some things in my life that you want to work on. Are there some areas in my life that you want to cut? Is there some places in my life that you want, to, you want me to change some, some patterns? Or you want me to start doing some things? that I haven't been doing. If you come to me with a list of 15, 20 things, I'm going to tell you I don't believe that's the Holy Spirit. Because he doesn't, he knows you and he knows that's impossible. I would ask him, is there one area in my life that I could start doing right now, either start doing, stop doing, whatever it is that would start to produce the fruit of my life that you desire to produce? I pray you be able to hear his voice clearly. And then you start to see the transformation and understand that you have a good God who wants to produce great things in your life. I pray God will bless you and use you mightily this week as you head back to your mission field and you will live for Jesus these other six days in such a way that people will not be able to miss who Christ is because you're a part of their life. God, thank you for this moment this morning. Now, as the worship team comes and closes, I invite you just to, to kind of end your time with us this morning in a time of worship. Amen.